If you are like most Christian readers, something probably feels a little bit off for you when you get to the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus turns to his disciples, opens up his mouth and says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And you say to yourself, hey, that's not quite right. I know those words. I'm sure I've heard those words before, but they weren't exactly like that. You might even grumble and complain about how modern translations seem to rob the words of the Bible from their poetic power. But here's the thing, there is nothing wrong with that translation, and yet... And yet you are still right. You have heard those words before, and they weren't quite like the words that are there in the Gospel of Luke. The words of Jesus you are thinking of, the more familiar words, are found in another Gospel. In the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Those are the words of Jesus that you remember. Those are the words of Jesus that people memorize and repeat to comfort themselves. And the reason we're so attached to the words as they are in Matthew's Gospel are many. They seem deeply spiritual as they challenge us to elevate our soul, to aspire to the deeper mysteries of the kingdom of God. I mean, sure, we may not be entirely certain what it means to be poor in spirit, but wow, that sure sounds like something we would like to be. And we may not be sure that we hunger and thirst for righteousness sake, but wow, we would like to. Then we turn over to the sayings in Luke's gospel and they just, we just don't have that same emotional reaction. I mean, sure, they're nice sentiments. We would like for the poor to be blessed. We would like for hungry people to get some food and the weeping, yes, they should be able to laugh. Everyone needs a good laugh. But the blessing seems so mundane, so down to earth in Luke's gospel. They don't seem to stir our hearts in quite the same way. As you can imagine, people have long wondered how all of this happened. How in two different Gospels we could have different versions of what seemed to be the same sayings of Jesus. It's hard to imagine that this was just a case of two people hearing the same words and mistakenly writing them down so differently. No, I think it's pretty clear that the writers of these Gospels went out of their way to present the words of Jesus in the way that they have. Because here's something you need to understand about the Gospels. They were never intended simply to be straightforward historical accounts. The job of a Gospel writer is not simply to tell you what happened to and around Jesus exactly as these things took place. No, it's pretty clear when you look closely at these books that they had a much more important goal in mind. Their job as they understood it was to communicate as best as they could their understanding of who Jesus was and what he stood for. Each one of them working as the Spirit inspired them tried to present their own unique understanding and angle that they had been given. And as you study these books closely, it's pretty easy to see how they have done that. They've done things like moved events around, reworded the sayings, done other similar things in order to accomplish their goals. So on the one hand, I would certainly argue that both Matthew and Luke are doing their very best to present what Jesus was teaching to his disciples. 
And yet, on the other hand, they are probably less concerned with getting the wording exactly right as we might have been expecting. And what's more, they do it all quite transparently. I believe that they openly signal their intentions. The famous, more familiar words in Matthew's Gospel are presented in a very specific context. Matthew tells us at the end of chapter 4 that Jesus was traveling all over Galilee and attacking huge, attracting huge crowds, especially those who were sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics. So Jesus has been surrounded by these people who are in deep need, doing his best to respond to them where they are. But then, as chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew begins, he climbs to the top of a mountain. And there he turns and he begins to speak to his disciples. Which is why, of course, the discourse that follows over the next three chapters of this Gospel is called the Sermon on the Mount. The symbolism of this setting should not be underestimated. The entire point of it I am sure is to make sure that we understand that everything that Jesus is saying is meant to elevate us, to make us think of heaven and heavenly realities. This is all about raising our eyes above the drudgery of everyday life and to proclaim eternal and spiritual truths. He wants us to strive after spiritual health rather than being concerned with the health of the body. He wants us to lay aside earthly hunger that we might suffer from because we have no food and hunger and thirst instead for what is right. Yes, he promises that the meek will inherit the earth, but if they are that meek, it is hard to imagine them ruthlessly exploiting what they've inherited inherited like people do today. And the peacemakers, yes, Yes, they may be making peace on earth, but they are shining far above this present realm, apparently as the children of God. And all of this, I want to stress, is absolutely true to who Jesus was and what Jesus stood for. And these aspects of Jesus' character are eloquently captured and presented in these Beatitudes, this opening passage of the Sermon on the Mount. But at the same time, we mustn't forget that Matthew only captured a certain aspect of Jesus' person and his message. See, it's true. True of any individual, really, that there's more to that person than just what can be experienced by one person. For example, say that I have a really good friend. You know, someone who I've always experienced as as being lighthearted and and a humorous sort of guy. You know, the kind of guy who's always telling a joke or finding something to laugh at. But somebody else might know that same person, but know them in a different context. Perhaps they know them in the workplace where they hold down a really demanding and difficult job. Well, I'll tell you something, that workplace associate might know that person in a very different way and see them as a much more serious type. But both I and that work associate would have their own description of this person, radically different descriptions, and yet, at the same time, both are correct because no one person's point of view can encompass a whole person. And if that's true of any individual, how much more is it true when we're talking as about such an extraordinary individual as Jesus. So honestly, honestly, we should not expect Matthew to entirely capture everything that Jesus taught, even in such an extraordinary passage as the Sermon on the Mount. That is why, by God's grace, we also have the Gospel of Luke. And there's no question in my mind that Luke is attempting to present the very same teaching of Jesus as the one we've received from the Gospel of Matthew. I mean, how that teaching has been preserved and and handed down in the early church is another question. I 
I, I'm not going to be able to dig into that here. But there's no doubt in my mind that this is a teaching from Jesus. But the writer of the Gospel of Luke is also doing his best to present his own understanding of Jesus and what he was trying to teach. And I believe he also goes out of his way to signal the perspective he is taking on that teaching. Remember how Matthew told us that Jesus went up the mountain to teach his disciples? Well, Luke kind of says the opposite. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Where Matthew told us that Jesus went up the mountain to deliver the lesson, Luke tells us he came down from the mountain and into the midst of the people. And what I would like to suggest is that Matthew is saying that he's going to tell us how this great spiritual teaching of Jesus might seem far uh, above the mundane concerns of this world, but they take on new meaning when you bring them down to the level place. And in that context, the words are transformed. Instead of speaking in exalted terms of the poor in spirit, we are told, <coughs> we are told that Jesus turned around and spoke directly to the poorest, the most destitute people in the crowd, saying, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And yes, yes, Jesus may have been concerned to bless those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, but when you get down onto the flat place, and you look at the people who are nearly starving, he knew that also meant saying, blessed are you who are just plain hungry now, for you will be filled. And I realize that these words in Luke's gospel may come across as being less poetic, maybe less inclined to make us think on heavenly truths, but they are truths that demand our attention when we pay attention to the misery of those who are living in the level place. Even more important, Luke is not afraid to do what I suspect Matthew was afraid of. Luke is not afraid to look at the other side of the story and understand that you cannot allow the poor and the meek to inherit the earth without it actually having a detrimental effect on the rich and the well-fed and those who laugh at the adversity of others. So Luke is not afraid to explain that this teaching will also bring woe and curses to those very people. For the kingdom can never come in power without the first becoming last, so that the last may become first. I know people often wonder why there are four Gospels when they all tell the story of one life death and resurrection. People especially wonder that when they realize how similar the first three are, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, with several passages in these three Gospels actually repeating the sayings and telling the stories about him using the very same words verbatim. Wouldn't it make more sense, people wonder, if, if we just had one Gospel that could tell the whole story properly? But I'm extremely grateful for what we have been given. For we cannot think that one writer's take on the teachings of Jesus could possibly capture everything he stood for. Yes, we need Matthew. We need Matthew to take us up to the mountaintop with his beatitudes. But we also need Luke to bring us back down to the level place. And perhaps we need to take a key lesson from this specific passage in the Gospel of Luke today. We need to remember that any spiritual teaching we embrace, yes, it may lift our thoughts up to the heavenly places, but we cannot fail to bring those teachings back down from the mountain and onto the level place, because any faith that does not also demand that we give thought, practical thoughts, to helping the poor, the hungry, and those who live lives that are nothing but tears. That is not a faith 
that is seeking to live according to the whole teaching of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for taking us up to the mountaintop, to, for lifting up our thoughts to the heavenly places. Let us not forget also to come down to the level place and see those who are in the greatest need around us and respond in practical ways. Thank you that both of these are the teaching that you have given to us. Amen.